I smell some peat in the air today. All I ever wanted to be was a tea planter. It was a mental switch that happened to towards uh, towards beverages. Fine, so I ended up meeting up with Yang Duplama, who used to work closely with him on a few projects that he was running. As a bar educator, I worked with a consultant firm called Taliho. Feather in my cap was uh, presenting a seminar at Tales of the Cocktail to, to a company called LDMH, uh, Louis Vuitton Moy Tennessee. I went into consulting for a few brands. In 19, Beam Centauri happened. And hmm. uh, well, here I am today. Done so much in India building the cocktail culture, but you're also out there uh, flying the flag. So the Ardmore is a single malt uh, distillery was established in 1898. The Ardmore is a single malt that gives us uh, this beautiful range of blended uh, Scotch whiskies called the Teachers. How you would compare the Highland peat that you spoke about in uh, the Ardmore and the Isla peat in uh, Bomo? So that's exactly what mm-hmm. peat looks like. <laughs> There's not much in that bottle, is it? Yeah, I, I completely envy you at this stage. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Discover series with the Whiskey Advisor. This is Uday Balaji. I smell some peat in the air today. So today we're going to be discovering all things the Ardmore with Program Manager of the Blend at Beam Suntory, Rohan Jelki. Hey Rohan, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Uday, good to be connected to you again. Uh, very, very happy to be a part of uh, what you've been doing at the Whiskey Advisor. Absolute, absolute delight. Absolute pleasure to have you. I've been wanting to do this for quite a while. I'm glad we finally did it. Uh, and before we get into the conversation, I'd just like to, as always, request you all to like, subscribe and hit that little bell so you'll get notified every time we have a video on the series. Um, so starting off with an important question. Ron, what do you have in your glass? Uh, Bit of the Ardmore to go along with you. Mm-hmm. So I've got the the triple wood that I'm having here. Uh, so that's the travel I detail. Had, I had the last bit of the Ardmore legacy with me, which is what we have at the domestic market. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. right here in the glass with me. Wonderful, wonderful. So I hope all of you have a drink in your glass as well. There's going to be a fun conversation. You might want to have a dram in hand. So Slanger. Slanger. So Rohan, until recently, I had no idea that you're also a trained chef. So along with being a chef, you've been uh, an educator, bartender, brand ambassador, a whole lot of different hats. So I just love to know, you know, could you tell us a a story about that journey and also more about your uh, love of beverages, please? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, my qualifications on paper as a chef, because, uh, you know, during my graduation, I, you know, I took up hotel schooling and I really wanted to be a chef. I come from a family of, uh, you know, that has interests in the tea business. You know, as a, uh, growing up, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, a part of my childhood was spent in the gardens. Uh, I still have family members who are in the tea business. And even before I, you know, zeroed down on the hospitality industry, all I ever wanted to be was a tea planter. Right? But as, uh, you know, as uh, fate would have it, that didn't work out and uh, uh, hospitality beckoned and I loved cooking. I loved cooking at home. You know, I come from a family uh, of, of, you know, uh, everyone loves to cook in my family and uh, taking up food was something that was easy. But during my, uh, during the time that I spent learning uh, about the craft, when I was put in uh, for my industrial exposure training, I, uh, even before I entered the kitchens, I Mm -hmm. ended up working in restaurant service. And during this time, I, I, you know, this was at a newly opened IDC property in Calcutta back then. And the two mentors I really got, you know, who kind of mentored me through my service training, completely changed my perspective towards beverages. And by the time I came out of training, uh, and I was in my final year in college, you know, I could wake up at three in the, uh, in, in the morning and start talking about wines or, even, you know, uh, open a book and read up about wines, which during my first year would have been probably about food. <laughs> so while I love food, but, but that's where I think I really kind of, uh, there was a mental switch that happened to, towards, uh, towards beverages and later on, of course, is the career choice. So I started off working in, in, in Bombay. I was with the IDC in Bombay. And then Delhi happened in 2006, towards the end of 2006, I'd come down to Delhi for, for actually a round of interviews. And uh, well, I didn't 
uh, as luck would have it, I didn't uh, clear the interviews that I'd come down for. But before I headed back, I had a bit of time. So I ended up meeting up with Yang Duplama, who, uh, of oh. course, runs, uh, you know, Cocktails and Dreams, a very popular bar school. And of course, he's today the owner of Sidecar and Speakeasy, two very popular bars here in Delhi and Kutau. And during that week that I spent in Delhi, I had an opportunity to work closely with him on a few projects that he was running for a couple of, you know, for a vodka brand and a, you know, and a rum brand that he was consulting for back then. And suddenly what happened was, you know, I, in that course of that one week or a bit over a week, I ended up meeting the people who ran these brands and, you know, crafted the programs around these brands in a market like India. So from being somebody behind the bar who just pick up one of these bottles and fix a drink or serve a drink, I was suddenly, you know, seeing how these brands were being brought to life uh, in, in India. Mm-hmm. And this was, this was still when the beverage industry was quite, quite young uh, uh, back then. And that's when I really decided this is what I want to be doing. I wanted to be a part of the larger beverage industry, be a part of, uh, you know, work my way into uh, creating that uh, roadmap for these brands in India. And that's, that's, I think, uh, how it really started for me. Then, of course, uh, over the years, you know, a big part of my journey was also as a bar educator. I worked with a consulting firm called Taliho. Uh, mm-hmm. That was a big learning curve for me. Uh, uh, while, while I was handling trainings for them, I got to work on multiple projects with beverage companies and hotel brands. Got to travel quite a bit. Uh, took up courses during that time. And uh, also, I think the, during that point in time, the, the top, the feather in my cap was uh, presenting a seminar at Tales of the Cocktail in oh, wow. 2012 it was the mm-hmm. first time i think uh, i perhaps was the first indian presenter at uh, to be speaking at tales and i spoke about native indian spirits and stuff that you know you and i know about you know mm-hmm. uh, what is produced in india and uh, t- 2013 uh, i shifted to a company called lvmh uh, louis vuitton moy tennessee where i took over as the brand ambassador for the company's wine champions and spirits portfolio did that uh, for about on that had for about uh, a bit over four years and uh, 2018 to half uh, to the mid of 2019 I was independent consulting for a few brands uh, helping a, uh, a couple of craft Indian brands expand into the Asian market and then the summer of 2019 Beam Centauri happened and mm-hmm. uh, well here I am today. Wonderful that that really is quite a journey because by the sound of it you know it's like you've it kind of ridden that wave of uh, and frankly contributed to it uh, of the whole, you know, uh, bartending and cocktail culture and beverage culture that's been growing in the country. You know, just to do something a little fun, we do a rapid fire every uh, episode just to lighten things up a little bit. Uh, yeah. Are you ready? Yep. Yeah. Go for it. All right. Your first whiskey. Mm. Uh well, I'll have to say I'm not very proud about this because I sneaked this out of my dad's uh, cabinet when he was not uh, looking. So this was actually a bottle of the Teachers 50 quite some time back. Um, uh-huh. took, a, uh, took a small swig of it before putting it back into the cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite bar in India? Um, there are quite a few. Uh, one bar that uh, I think one of my favorite bars would still be a bar that has since closed called Ellipsis. This was the bar that I think really brought in uh, the cocktail drinking culture into India uh, back in 2012, 2013 when it opened. And this was also the time that Pisu had opened in Delhi. So these two bars, I uh, really kind of started it. Today, closer, uh, I think I have a selection of bars that I'd refer to. In Delhi, I would probably head to a, to a sidecar or to a fig and maple in Delhi uh, or to get together at Twelfth and Grugan. If I'm in Bombay, I'd perhaps be at, uh, at uh, Bombay Canteen or Thirsty City. If I'm in Bangalore, I'd probably be drinking at Big Brewski. So yeah, okay. I don't, there isn't one single bar. But so guys, I hope you noted all that down and go visit these places. Comes you recommended by Rohan. Think, <laughs> yeah, they're doing some great, great work in these bars. Uh, favorite food? Ooh, quite a, uh, quite a lot actually. I uh, Home food, anyone, any place, if I get home food, I'm a sucker for home food. But if there's one cuisine that I really like, it's there got to be Oriental. I think it's so diverse. Mm-hmm. There are, you know, every country has its own interpretation of Oriental. I mean, look at India, we do Chinjabi so successfully. But then if you're in Malaysia, you're in, uh, mm-hmm. or you're in Singapore or Taiwan, there are, uh, you know, there are so many different expressions of Oriental food. I really, really enjoy eating Oriental. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, favorite sport and or team? Mm, growing up, cricket would have been my answer, but uh, I lost uh, touch with the game. Today, I enjoy watching badminton, playing it in parts, uh, and I really enjoy cycling and a bit of uh, road running. 
um, uh, so uh, because both in okay. uh, both in cycling and in badminton you could be an individual player at at the same time you could be uh, working as a part of a team uh, cats or dogs dogs without a doubt i love dogs <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> always had them around and i and i absolutely love dogs mm -hmm. uh, cars or bikes bikes and definitely the ones with pedals on them uh -huh. uh, beaches or mountains mountains any day uh, I love the beaches, but mountains is where the heart is. Mm -hmm. I can take off to the mountains anytime. Coffee or tea? Mm, bit of both. My morning cup would be typically be a coffee, a uh, cup of coffee to wake me up. Uh, but if there's a soul drink, that's got to be tea. Uh, you'd actually find me drinking a lot of coffee outside, but when it comes to tea, because I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to tea, because I like to, there's a, there's a particular way I like my tea to be made. Uh, so mm -hmm. I will make it myself. So I have a, a bit of a tea collection at home, uh, make oh, wow. a pot for myself every day. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm going to come visit you when I'm in Delhi next. <laughs> oh, you must, you must do. I've got some, I've got some very, very nice uh, white teas. I can, I'll get mm -hmm. this uh, from different parts. Yeah. I'll bring you some Nilgiri tea from here as well. I have some Nilgiri white tea as well, but I'm, uh -huh. uh, I'd love to have some more in my collection. Done. Uh, Batman or Superman? Batman. Any mm -hmm. day. <laughs> okay, to finish <laughs> out, favorite place in the world? Mm, again, quite a few. I think uh, uh, closer home in India, I really enjoy going to Manali because that's always been my gateway to the, uh, to the mountains. Uh, I love Colombo. It's uh, probably mm -hmm. my easiest destination for a holiday. If I've got a longish weekend, uh, I'd probably be taking off uh, to Colombo. Uh, quite a few cities across Asia and the world, but uh, one city that really stood out in terms of a trip and an experience. It's not really a favorite place, but as an experience, I think that really molded me would be a visit to Auschwitz uh, that I'd mm -hmm. done a few years back when I was uh, in Poland for some work. I'd gone over to Krakow and then from Kra Krakow to Auschwitz for about a day, day and a half. Uh, really ended up changing my perspective to life and kind of, uh, uh, it was uh, quite a, quite a uh, experience. That's definitely a place on my bucket list, but there's always mm -hmm. that kind of like, you know, hesitation of whether to actually go or not. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely go I, one day. No, I, I absolutely recommend that you should because, you know, you it, it, it's it's such a big slice of uh, of history, right, uh, mm -hmm. of what happened in Auschwitz. And, you know, it'll give you a perspective of how uh, how the world is today. And it's, it's a place that will uh, completely overwhelm you, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it'll also give you a newfound respect to life. I mean, when I came out, when I, uh, when I came back, I think I came back uh, much, much more humbler, right? And, uh, you know, uh, today you and I might complain about 10 different things, but to mm -hmm. think about what really happened back then and it really yeah. humbles you. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, really puts it into perspective. Yeah. Absolutely it does. So uh, moving on to uh, something. So I'd gone to uh, Taiwan sometime back. Uh, so the reason why I had gone was I went to uh, check out the whiskey distilleries, obviously, and then also check out all the legendary uh, whiskey bars. And I was in Taipei mm -hmm. one evening and wanted to do something different. So I went down to uh, Indulge Experimental Bistro, which uh, if you guys haven't heard of it, it's one of the best bars in Asia. And I generally travel alone. So I went there and I sat at the bar, had a couple of drinks and got chatting with the uh, bartender. I think her name was Grace. So after a little while, she said, you know, okay. not so long back, uh, there was this Indian gentleman who came over and did a bar takeover and shared like the nicest things to say. And uh, he left this bottle of Paul John Select Cast Classic behind. And uh, so we ended up finishing quite a bit of it. <laughs> but yeah. but yeah. guys, it was Rohan. And it, I thought it was absolutely amazing. You know, you've done so much in India, building the cocktail culture, but you're also out there uh, flying the flag and you know you said the tales of cocktail also how's your experience been on the road and you know doing all these bar takeovers and uh, you know generally your experience on the road well i think uh, for me travel's been my greatest teacher right um, being in the whole ambassador slash uh, slash uh, advocacy space we do as you know brand people we travel quite a bit on work but when it comes to learning i think travel is also a big teacher you know, as much as I'd love to be able to do uh, take up courses uh, around the, uh, you know, around beverages or other other businesses that I'm interested in, I don't often get the time. Uh, we don't. Mm -hmm. right? But I think travel really puts into perspective uh, 
into, uh, it gives you an insight into cultures and people, right? And cultures could be so varied, people could be so varied, you know, people's approach or a culture's approach to certain aspects of life could be very varied. For example, humor, right? The way we approach humor in India to say how uh, someone in Australia or an Australian might approach humor is very different. Not to say mm -hmm. that they are wrong and we are right or, or that our sense of humor is not developed, that, that'd be absolutely untrue. But it will give you a deeper understanding and appreciation of people's cultures because for the business that you and I are in, especially in the hospitality business, where we meet people from, uh, from so many different parts of the world, I think it's, it's really, really important to be able to understand and appreciate different cultures because we meet these people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think which is why travel for me has, has been a big teacher. I've tried to uh, travel throughout most of Asia and, I've, you know, uh, I'd like to travel more around Europe and, you know, when even uh, for that matter, uh, you know, when I travel to the U.S., uh, amazing experience. So I, I try to pack in a couple of trips a year to a place mm -hmm. that I've not been to. And it, uh, much like yourself, I'm a solo traveler too. So it kind of helps me, it lets me really kind of uh, plan and at the same time not really plan my trip, uh, if you know what I mean. So it oh, yeah. kind of keeps, uh, it, you know, it, so that's the fun of it. Like, for example, Taiwan. Taiwan was amazing. It was always on my bucket list. So Taiwan happened because I was doing a guest shift at Indulge. And, you know, the gentleman mm -hmm. who runs uh, Indulge is a dear friend, Aki. Uh, he's also seen as the godfather of the modern Taiwanese bar industry. Okay. Um, apart from that, I also wanted to visit distilleries in Taiwan. But more than that, I really wanted to discover the culture of this country, right? Because it's a fiercely independent country. Um, and one that, at, uh, you know, uh, is also referred to as the Republic of China. But if, for, for the Taiwanese, they look at themselves as an independent country. And the food, oh my God. Um, I, I, I lived close to Din Tai Fung, and I could tell you that a lot of <laughs> money was spent uh, in Din Tai Fung. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the food in Taiwan was the best thing because after having done whiskey trips to Scotland and Ireland and stuff, Taiwan, you know, good food everywhere, the street markets, yeah, Tim yeah, Tai Fung, yeah. so many options. Wow. But you know, talking about a little bit of a food connection, uh, the other day I was on your Instagram and I came across a story uh, of uh, fat washing in cocktails yeah. uh, by the yeah. chef turned uh, bartender. And so I was like, you know, I'd seen that you were involved in this thing called the blend. I didn't know exactly what it was, but after seeing that, and I kind of fancy myself as a little bit of a mixologist after all this lockdown and all that. So I mm -hmm. wanted to up my skills and went and uh, logged on to the blend. And I thought it was an absolutely fantastic resource, not just for bartenders, but also, you know, for enthusiasts like me. Uh, so guys, uh, Rohan runs the program in India. Uh, Rohan, could you just tell us a little bit about it? please? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that you enjoyed uh, seeing what we're doing as a part of the blend. Uh, so the blend is Beam Centauri's global bartender engagement initiative. Uh, it's the platform through which we, you know, we celebrate and support the bartender's journey across his or her career. And uh, as a, as a program, it was piloted in Australia and New Zealand for about about four years before it was rolled out uh, out of Australia. And in 2019, India became the first market outside of uh, uh, out of Australia and New Zealand to uh, activate the blend. With that, I came on board as the program manager for the blend in India. And what we try to achieve through the blend and as the blend expands its uh, network across uh, other Beam Centauri markets, our principal aim is to basically keep the global bartending community uh, connected to our portfolio of brands through a mm -hmm. variety of mediums. <clears throat> you know, there is always the training angle where we do in-house trainings or in-outlet trainings where an ambassador or maybe I would go in and do trainings. Uh, then we also do a lot of uh, master classes uh, where when we get an international uh, experts or international mentors to come and do a round of trainings. Uh, we also celebrate World Bartender Day, right? Uh, this is something that Beam Centauri has been celebrating for a, a bit over than half a decade now. And it is something that we believe in very strongly. To be able to celebrate the craft of bartending is very important for us. So World Bartender Day, think about it. We've, you know, we have World Champagne Day, World Whiskey Day, World Cocktail yeah. Day. We recently celebrated World Gin Day. But, uh, you know, nobody really knows when World Bartender Day is. So 24th of February every year, we celebrate World Bartender Day. Uh, then we also have a cocktail competition called the Perfect Blend Cocktail Competition, which we are looking at, uh, you know, getting into India very, very soon. In fact, as as uh, soon as this year. And then to support all of this in the back end, we also have the uh, have the website, the blend world. So that is where that becomes an online resource for uh, for uh, brand knowledge or category led information, or more so if you want to understand what's happening in the buy industry today. There's a lot of great content on it, and it's all up there for free. 
you know, for bartenders or for that ma- matter, uh, you know, a consumer like yourself who's, who's an evolved consumer and you love knowing more about beverages, it's, it's all you need to do is register, go on. And the module that you actually were talking about uh, is, uh, is a series, uh, is a part of mm-hmm. a series done by this uh, chef turned bartender called Luke Beatty, who runs a bar called Birdie in Melbourne in Australia. And Luke's brought his learnings from the kitchen into the bar. So he talks about things like how you can use different forms of sugars and acids or to fats and oils or how to create different textures in cocktails. And it's fun. It's really fun because this is, you know, for, for, an, uh, for a bartender who spends some time in the industry and aspires to know bigger and better, the blend becomes mm-hmm. a perfect platform. And I'll put that link in uh, the description as well, guys. You should go check it out, even if you're just an enthusiast. Yeah. Okay, so the heart of it uh, today is talking about Ardmore. Uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about the Ardmore, uh, Rowan, and also guys, it has a relationship with a blend that we're all very familiar with. Uh, mm-hmm. So Rowan, take it away. Yeah, so the Ardmore is a single malt. Uh, distillery was established in 1898, right? So that makes Ardmore a 122-year-old distillery. Now, for a market like India, you know, many times when I talk to consumers, you know, consumers may not have heard about an Ardmore before because, you know, it's one, uh, in terms of availability, it's one of the more recent uh, brands available in India, though globally Ardmore is a very well-recognized brand. And at the heart of it, the Ardmore is a single malt that, uh, that, kind, uh, that gives us uh, this beautiful range of blended uh, Scotch whiskeys called the Teachers. Right. Uh, so the teachers uh, whiskeys have been around since 1831 when William Teacher established the company. And, you know, uh, through the 1800s, as the dem- as uh, blended Scotch whiskey as a category grew and given the fact that in the mid 1800s, you had the whole phylloxera, uh, pan- uh, you know, pandemic, uh, mm-hmm. so, to, to borrow the word that from the <laughs> times that we're living in. Uh, uh, phylloxera caused the complete destruction of the wine industry in Europe, and which meant that you know there were no cognacs and brandies and wines and champions to drink. People took to drinking Scotch whiskey uh, in in large parts, and this led to a you know to an increase uh, not only in the demand for Scotch whiskey, but uh, you know brands ramped up uh, uh, production. And we realized that going forward, to maintain sub, uh, you know consistency in the blend, we needed to be able to create our own malt whiskey. And with this in mind, uh, Adam Teacher, this, uh, the, uh, the, one of the sons of William Teacher, established the Ardmore Distillery in a small little place called, uh, place called Kenneth Mott, very close to Aberdeen. In fact, if you ever go up to the, uh, to the Eastern Highlands, in fact, Kenneth Mott actually lies in the Highlands, which is why the Ardmore is a Highland whiskey. Though in some books or some whiskey journals, you might actually find it mentioned as a part of the space side area because the village really is at the cusp of where space side ends and Highland starts. And one of the smartest things that the family did while uh, building the distillery was that they uh, located the distillery right next to where the train line from Aberdeen goes into Inverness, right? So in times past, this uh, close proximity to a railhead meant that our whiskeys were coming into the distillery, uh, you know, for, to be blended uh, for teachers or the, the, teach, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the malt from Atmo was going out to, uh, uh, to be sold in, in, in markets in markets and uh, today of course uh, the Ardmo is popular throughout uh, throughout the world as a single malt as well uh, apart from being the heart of the teachers teachers blend uh, you'll find a lot of actually private whiskey bottlers like Gordon McPhail or for mm-hmm. that matter even the SNWS uh, doing private bottlings of uh, of the Ardmo whiskeys mm-hmm. you got a, you got the triple wood uh, you've got mm-hmm. the Triple Wood, which is a, a travel retail special. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You have it in travel retail. And I've got, the, uh, you know, I've got a, a Ardmore Legacy, which is what we have in the domestic market. And soon mm-hmm. you'll see more expressions of the Ardmore coming in. Uh, into oh, lovely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And how about the teachers uh, range in India Road? So if you see, teachers has been around for the longest time in India. Right. Uh, you know, in fact, if I'm not wrong, it was the first uh, whiskey to be uh, uh, to be bought in. Uh, into India and uh, the local bottling for, uh, for teachers was done mm-hmm. in uh, India way back in 94 or 95. So it's been around since that point in time, which explains why I did find that bottle of uh, the, the teachers 15, my dad's, uh, dad's oh, yeah. uh, cabinet. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the range really starts with the teachers Highland cream, which is, uh, you know, which is the uh, really the largest selling variant of the portfolio goes on to the teachers 50. Now, the Teachers 50 is a blend that was specially uh, created for the Indian market to celebrate India's 50th year of independence in 1997. Mm-hmm. And it okay. also, uh, 50 signifies that it has uh, uh, a 50% malt content in the blend. 
goes on to the teacher's origin, which uh, uh, contains up to 65% of uh, malt uh, in the blend. And then we have the teacher's golden thistle, which uh, you know, I have a bottle of it here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a 12 year old expression of the teacher's, uh, uh, of the teacher's whiskies. Uh, and is uh, during maturation, what we do is that we allow this whiskey to first mature in a selection of European and American casks. And then for the finishing bit, we transfer it into X, uh, into Isla casks that would have, you know, okay. held Isla whiskey previously. So there's this really fine balance of, you know, the smokiness that comes in from the Atmo and, uh, and a bit of that Isla, uh, Isla smokiness. And overall, as a, as a portfolio, with the teachers, what we try, uh, what uh, we do is always to work with a high malt content in our mm -hmm. in our blends. And since the Ardmo forms the basis of these uh, uh, of the blends, it also brings it that nice, beautiful Highland uh, peat character into the whiskies. I'm glad you mentioned the Highland peat character because I have a bottle of one of your other uh, brands as well. So, guys. Oh, uh, they Beam Santori owns two uh, distilleries on Isla. One is Lafroy, who all of us would have heard of. And the other one is Bomo, which is actually the oldest distillery on uh, Isla. <laughs> There's not much in that bottle. Is. Yeah, I, I completely envy you at this stage. This bottle saw me through most of lockdown. And I've got a oh, precious yeah. bit left, a precious bit left here, which I'm uh, holding on to. Uh, uh -huh. But yeah, this is, this is definitely uh, a beautiful, beautiful uh, Isla whiskey. Yeah. This one is post lockdown. To be honest, yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, could you just tell us more about uh, the bomb? Sorry, bomb or uh, Rohan? And I'd really like to know uh, how you would compare the Highland peat that you spoke about in uh, the Ardmore and the Isla peat in uh, Bomo. Right, so uh, the Bomo is a distillery, uh, goes uh, dates back to 1779. Interestingly, Bomo is also the name of the capital uh, village or capital mm -hmm. town of the island of Isla. And as the second oldest distillery in Scotland, Bomo also has the distinction of actually having the oldest Scotch whiskey cellars in the whole of Scotland. Our cellars, our vaults, as we call them, date back to 1779. And uh, uh, Bomo, I think, is a very beautiful expression of what an Isla malt can be. Because for us, uh, you know, for consumers, Isla is, uh, you know, home to the smokiest styles of, uh, of of Scotch whiskey and single malt Scotch whiskey. But Bowmore, I think, is a uh, is a great example because uh, Bowmore isn't the most peatiest uh, uh, Isla whiskey you would find in our portfolio. That would be Lafroy. Uh, in Bowmore, your levels of ppm or that uh, the, that level of smoke is at about 20 25 uh, ppm. Mm -hmm which means that it's a very approachable Isla, uh, Isla whiskey. And for somebody who may not have tried an Isla whiskey before, the Bomo becomes an excellent choice for somebody who wants to try what an Isla whiskey uh, is like and then can graduate onto you know, older expressions of the Bomo or onto a Lafroy. And in my experience of you know, uh, doing whiskey trainings, tastings, or talking about whiskey, I've often noticed that consumers, when, they come, when it comes to scotch, consumers often have this kind of a misconception that scotch whiskeys are always smoky. Right. In fact, they're not. Most uh, you and I know that uh, perhaps most of the mainland of Scotland doesn't doesn't even produce uh, whiskies that are uh, very peated or peated at all. Right? Uh, Isla is one. Uh, Isla is, of course, known uh, Isla or the islands or parts of uh, you know uh, the highlands would produce such whiskies. The Atmo, for example, is the only traditionally peated uh, uh, highland whisky. Uh, and the peat that you get, depending on where your peat comes from, peat, as you know, is uh, decomposed vegetation that we kind of that we use, we dig out, and uh, oh, you got some uh, peat yeah, here. Yeah. You got peat, yeah. So that's exactly yeah. so that's exactly what mm -hmm. peat looks like. And as you see, it is it's not really uh, it's it's a fossil fuel that is like uh, that is dried vegetation you'd have seen in their sample in your sample or there there is uh, you know there's grass sticking to it. So and uh, uh, just a just a bit of a fun fact here. It takes about roughly a hundred years for an inch of peat to form, right? So that's the amount of work mm -hmm. Mother Nature does for you before we take that peat out and we uh, put it into you, uh, into good use. So Highland peat uh, predominantly uh, is comprised of uh, dried grass or dead trees, twigs, broken wood that would have gone into the earth and got gotten compressed into peat, as mm -hmm. opposed to peat that comes from Isla. Now, Isla peat is primarily composed of dead sea vegetation, sea moss, seaweed, uh, or other sea vegetation that would, uh, you know, that would have gone into the soil and turned into peat. And 
Highland tea tends to be, you know, in my in my opinion, I, I've always found Isla tea to be a bit more dense and hence a bit mm-hmm. more uh, in a higher than moisture content. Because when when you burn both of them, yes, uh, there is smoke that is produced by the kind of smoke that you get, and eventually the kind of aroma profile that you get is very different. Highland people, uh, peat will give you an aroma profile that will remind you of wood smoke. Now, when I talk about wood smoke, think of a bonfire, right? Think of a bonfire. Think about the last time you would have, uh, if you've been to a hill station, you sat by a bonfire. The next day, your your jacket or your sweater right. or clothes would still be smelling of that, you know, that uh, bonfire smoke. So that wood smoke is very unique to Highland uh, peat, whereas Isla peat will give you the more uh, uh, stronger style of smokiness, where that we often describe as, uh, you know, things like iodine or tar. Uh, if you ever smelled smoked bacon or smoked fish, if, uh, if you smelled what a cigar smoke smells like, all of that is very typical to Isla Peak. Now, mm-hmm. uh, what you also need to remember is that if uh, Highland, uh, uh, if, a, if, a, if a certain single malt that uses Highland peat is used as the base for a particular blend, as opposed to a single malt uh, from uh, that uses Isla peat that forms the base of a certain blend, those blends will also uh, also taste okay. different. That is something that uh, I think we need to recognize and understand. It is interesting because I was just nosing it as you were talking about it. And I, I highly recommend this, guys. Uh, this this one thing to do get get a couple of whiskeys, one Highland and one uh, Isla, and just compare them. It's amazing. Uh, because a lot of the time we just do smoky or non-smoky. We don't try, yeah. and smoke doesn't necessarily need to come from peat either. So it's good yeah. to do comparisons rather than just have one whiskey at a time, buy a few bottles and compare them all. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, the, uh, uh, I think uh, the BOMO is a great int- uh, introduction, like I said, because, you know, I think you would have found this during your tastings as well. Uh, or there mm-hmm. Somebody who may not have tried an Isla whiskey before, you know, they find it, uh, f- sometimes they find the whole approach to an Isla whiskey or drinking an Isla whiskey quite daunting because of the mm-hmm. smoke, because, you know, it's a, it can be a bit of an acquired acquired taste this is where i think as a as a medium or a, a moderately peated uh, isla whiskey uh, the bomo is a great proposition and we've got the bomo 12 available in india uh, in travel retail there's a wider selection available some of which is going to be available in the domestic market uh, market very oh, wow. very soon mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, you know, uh, I think that the Bowmore, one of the beautiful things with the Bowmore, apart from the peat, is also the way the whiskey balances that, uh, 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 you know, the character of the wood, right? 70% of your flavor in a glass of good whiskey is mm-hmm. from the way uh, the uh, whiskey has matured inside a certain selection of, uh, of barrels. And, if, and in your glass of uh, uh, Bowmore 12 over there, if you just add a drop of water, just a touch of water and you smell it, you'll actually notice this really beautiful lemon-like citrus and a bit of that uh, bit of a sweet mint, like this floral mint character that kind of opens up uh, with the addition of water to the Bomo. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now that you mentioned it. Yeah, and and, and and that's this this mm-hmm. for the 12, that's really the beauty of the uh, ex ex bourbon casks that we use. That brings in that beautiful balance between that uh, between the smoke and the uh, uh, and the uh, you know the wood. Beautiful. So guys, uh, like Rohan said, the Boma is a great um, gateway, Isla Malt, if you can call it that. But also, if you guys ever get to visit Isla, do the full tour at the distillery. It's pr- in my opinion, with the flow malting and everything, it's an excellent tour to understand how whiskey is made. And of course, the number one vault as well, which is uh, absolutely amazing. Um, yes. So, so Rohan, this has been absolutely fantastic. You know, the time has just flown by. I really, yeah. really love this conversation. But guys, for now, uh, if you want to get in touch with Rohan, uh, I put his details in the description below, as well as the details about the brands and a link to the Bowmore uh, YouTube channel. So go check it out. There are some cool videos. Uh, But Rohan, thank you so much for being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, We'll be seeing you soon. (laughs) Absolutely. Look forward to it. Either with some bourbon or some good Japanese whiskey. But once again, Oh, Japanese as well. Mm -hmm. Cheers, Rohan. Cheers. Cheers. All right, that's all for this session, folks. Uh, As always, I'd like to ask you to like, subscribe, and hit the little bell so you'll get notified every time we have a new video in this series. Until next week, 
Cheers. Cheers.